practices engaging youth from our youth. This session aims to enhance participants' understanding of best practices in engaging newcomer youth by building the capacity of settlement service providers to incorporate practical tools and practices. Through a panel of experts, successful strategies will be shared and challenges in integrating newcomer youth support services into programs will be discussed. The session aims to foster collaboration, learning, and innovation in supporting newcomer youth effectively. And I would love to introduce Introduce our wonderful moderator, Tarana Sultan, Coordinator of Community Education at Okazi. Tarana coordinates development and delivering a professional development training program focused on settlement, employment, and newcomer youth support initiatives. Previously, she coordinated Okazi's Enhancing Governance in for Public Benefit Organizations project, coordinating the steering committee, outreach strategies, and stakeholder communications with an MSA in International Development and a BA in Physics, Toronto brings expertise in project cycle management and education program development across various sectors, including government, international, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, and the private sector. Her adaptability and resourcefulness are evident in her successful collaborations with major donors like the City of Toronto, IRCC, CIC, UNHCR, USAD, and various foundations where she has made significant contributions to their initiatives. Thank you, Azrin. Thank you, everyone. I am really happy to see um, all the faces full of uh, auditory and the sessions uh, previously. Thank you very much for your active participation. I hope our uh, this session also will be interesting to you. And I am very excited and also proud to in introduce you our guest speakers, uh, young, enthusiastic, talented experts to be on the panel today. So allow me, and I am, I am so sorry, I have two different visions for the and the reading, so I will change. I put my glasses on and off. So I would like to invite Victor Zhang, Miajan Nagizade, Stephen Enrique Joseph Kalikaden, and Kitusa Sot Sotiswaran. Sorry, Sotiswaran. Please have a seat, Victor is a choir and feminist activist, educator, and researcher. His scholarship and activism are situated in the fields of choir uh, migration experience, as well as transitional feminist work in the Pan-Asia area. He currently works as an education training specialist at the 519. Before joining the 519, he worked as a youth project coordinator at the settlement agency speci specializing in youth mental health, pre-employment, support, art programming, and youth-oriented social activism. He also has both academic and professional experiences in community advocacy and social activism, pertaining to different issues subjects, such, such as gender-based violence, workers' rights, anti-Asian racism, Queer Health Justice. Medjion Nagizade, Outreach Coordinator, Youth Assisting Youth. Medjion, born in 1992, first generation Canadian, to, family, to a family that immigrated to Canada during the 1980s. He went to Seneca to, for creative advertising. After graduating, he became a copywriter for the business exchange magazine, The Edge, a leader's magazine. He was left, let go during the pandemic and bounced around between jobs from 2020 to 2022 to, to make ends meet. We probably, many of us did that. He got a job as a marketing estimator for Tarpeda Marketing, but after the pandemic, something changed. Mijan wasn't happy in the office anymore and he felt 
he could do more, helping more. And he didn't want to be tied to the desk any longer. So Mijan applied to, to youth assisting youth, got a position in 2024. The work uh, youth assisting youth do in strengthening our commun community, building child child's confidence and help, helping them, I'm so sorry, helping them in other ways is why Mijan says, get out of bed every day and go to work with a smile on, on my face. That makes me smile so much. Uh, Steph Stefan, Stefan Enrique Joseph Kalikaden. Uh, Stefan is a youth and access to education coordinator at FCJ Refugee Center as, and is a graduate from the community worker program at George Brown College. They have, that's, I'm not sure why it's happening to me today. <laughs> they have worked in the sector since 2012 and in various capacities and have a strong passion in youth right access to education and access to education. They work with an intersectional and anti-racism, anti-oppression framework and emphasize an equity-rooted approach to integration and innovation while working in and with community. Their work is centered around giving people the tools to facilitate the process of informing their futures by themselves and avoid being at the mercy of gate gate kept system navigation information. Ketusa Sot Sot is Varan, I'm so sorry, Ketusa. <laughs> Newcomer uh, Youth Engagement Program uh, Strides Toronto. Ketusa dedicated to supporting youth and community development began dur during her university year, where she coordinated the women's center at the University of Waterloo. Her passion for community engagement and social justice stems from her personal experience as a refugee who arrived in Canada in late 1980s. As a proud queer Tamil individual, Kitusa is driven to make a positive impact in the newcomer youth uh, community, leveraging her unique perspective to amplify diverse vo voices. She firmly believes that fostering constructive change requires creating platform within organization that encourage the sharing of, of diverse opinion and perspectives. With background in the international education and BA in political science and gender studies, Ketusa has focused on settlement services for the past four years. Her professional experience has included roles at Abuse Never Becomes Us, YMCA, and currently Strides Toronto. Let's maybe applaud our speakers, panel speakers first. Welcome. And I will invite speakers one by one. And first question, if you don't mind, will come from me. Please first introduce yourself but I already did introduce you. Describe your organization youth program and strategies for engaging newcomer youth. Briefly outline the characteristic of youth your organization serves. I will turn on the presentation now and probably will leave you for a few minutes and we'll join back. Five minutes, first question. Thank you so much, Serena. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Victor. My pronouns him and him. Uh, I'm an education and training specialist from the 519. Um, so as you can tell, I'm actually not primarily working in the um, newcomer youth sector anymore. Um, I used to uh, work with CSCS, so I saw so many f familiar faces today, and I'm really glad I'm here. And but I but my previous work is actually sort of connect to what I'm doing right now, especially 
Now I work with uh, 519, which is a um, community agency, the largest community agency in Canada serving 2 LGBTQIA um, community members. It is also one of the community centers that are directly affiliated with City of Toronto. So we do not just work with you know queer and trans community members. We also work with you know community members in our neighborhoods. So this is actually the kind of the nice picture of our building. If you have ever been in the neighborhood of like Church and Wesley, definitely definitely pay us a visit um, because we do have lots of programs, including youth programs. And the reason why I want to um, um, kind of like bring this up, especially in the context of um, newcomer youth work, um, because our work is actually. Um, uh, works with lots of um, youth with um, diverse um, experience, especially um, you know refugee youth and youth who experience um, poverty, homelessness, uh, youth who experience discrimination, youth, youth who experience um, you know unemployment. I just want to do a, a really quick rundown, like not even rundown, just like because like I cannot really cover all aspects of the history, but. Um, you can see, like you know, um, queer and trans people in this country have been experiencing um, lots of um, direct oppression from our systems, direct from the colonial Canadian government. And when we talk about the context, the context of Ontario, gender expression and gender identity, they were not added to Ontario Human Rights Code until 2012. So that's not a long time ago, and they were not introduced at a federal level until 2017. So last year, the 519 had overwhelming demand for settlement services with over 8,000 newcomers reaching out for help. So the um, number of uh, queer and trans refugees in our province um, uh, has gone up and there's an a, a increasing demand. And we, and we can literally see um, the demographic of um, those um, you know, queer and trans refugees. Most of them are young people, they are youth, and who do not necessarily fall into our understanding of uh, you know, what youth means in our services, right? Because they don't have families, they don't go to schools, and they don't have tools to navigate themselves. Most of them, they stay in the shelters and they experience harassment, um, discrimination based on um, their status and their sexuality. We have um, in the, uh, I think in May, we actually had a one, uh, refugee intake day where um, everyone from the agency came together to finish the intake process for all the re uh, refugee clients uh, we are trying to help because we do have a legal team to help them go through the um, refugee uh, clemation process. And, and during one day, we served around, um, around um, 1,500 um, you know, refugee clients. And most of them, some of them, they traveled from London, Ontario, from Niagara Falls, from Kingston because they, there's no shelters, uh, there's no shelter for them um, to stay in the greater Toronto area. Um, but they need the service from the family team. And they, this also tells how limited th those services are in our province, in our country, specifically for queer and trans identified um, youth. So uh, queer and trans youth, um, especially new, queer and trans newcomer youth, they um, experience, you know, um, barriers to health services, they also have language barriers, they have really different understandings of their identities, you know, because sometimes like, you know, queer and trans identities, they can come from a very westernized standpoint when it comes to the understanding of what that identification means. They also experience um, a, a great level of mental health issues. Um, there's definitely a, a ongoing issues about um, housing for, not just for queer and, and trans newcomer youth, but also so for the you know the broader sense of um, queer and, and trans youth in our country, and uh, uh, earlier this year, um, Toronto Shelter System just launched the new um, kind of service where they provide ten beds specifically for gender non-conforming identified um, queer and trans refugees in, in our uh, province, and that's that's uh, actually a, a, the first kind of like initiative that is um, to primarily serving queer and trans um, refugees. If we think about that, we think about the number of 10 beds, we, we can actually understand you know, the seriousness of the issue because we just do not have resources, we do not have awareness about the certain populations. They often go under our radar. And many um, queer and trans ref uh, uh, youth refugees, um, they made, some of them, they did receive uh, education in their home countries, but the foreign credentials were not recognized in our systems. And LSCC also prolonged processing times for them. 
um, you know, they are very active in our communities, actually. Why? Because lots of queer and um, trans services and community programs in our province, they rely on volunteers. And many queer and trans um, refugee claimants, they need to be active in our community to be recognized by the RSCC procedure, which really um, creates this, the, another layer of discrimination and kind of abuse of um, you know, you know, their um, ability and their time in our system. And also, um, they often face discrimination and also uh, legal and documentation issues uh, where never getting themselves at the work in the workplace. So, um, just a, a one fact I'm sharing: name change and gender make uh, marker change in Ontario um, requires two-hour month residency requirements, which really put um, um, lots of queer and trans um, youth newcomers in a very difficult place if they don't reach the residency requirement, if they don't have the money, um, they do not have the tool to change their names and to change their gender marker uh, that can be aligned with their own uh, personal ad ad identity. So I just want to share something about, um, so we do have um, legal service for um, the queer and trans uh, youth. We have trans ID clinic where we provide self-help guides and templates and samples. Uh, we also offer some financial um, support um, to um, many trans and non non uh, gender non-conforming uh, newcomer youth and also one-on-one -on -one supports. Some practices I want to share with all of you. Um, the first is to be proactive. You never know, you know the identity and also the lived experiences of the, the youth clients you are facing with. So just keep in mind that you may have already encountered with um, a youth client uh, who's queer, who's trans, um, they just do not feel safe to disclose that information to you. Also use they as your default. Using they, them as a pronoun in our English language can date back to the time of Shakespeare. Even Shakespeare used, used they, them as a pronouns to address the characters in his place. So this is not new. This is now some new creation by, you know, queer and trans people in our language. And ask for, for and share pronouns regularly. I noticed that um, for some of you, you may now um, put pronouns on your name tag. I always do, and I don't think, um, and I also want to share this. It's not about um, you know, forcing people share, uh, to share their pronouns with you. I always share my pronouns. I don't expect people to share their pronouns with me. But every time when I say my name is Victor, my pronouns are him, him I'm sending a signal to people that I, sharing pronouns is in my practice. And if you want to do that, please um, feel to do so. And also we want to make sure we promote self-determination and we want to interrupt any generalizations based on gender. It's not just for you know, queer and trans youth, queer, queer and trans newcomers, queer and trans refugees. It's also about all of us because we encounter, especially many women encounter with barriers because of patriarchy, because of the, you know, the societal demands about what a, a, you know, you know, women um, should look like. And we should all come to together to challenge that. Last but not least, I just want to share the picture and the QR code. If you want to support um, you know, um, the initiative um, by the Farm Night team or anything you want, to, I hope I have more time to share about our initiatives. Um, but that's everything for, uh, for now for the first question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Victor. And now I think it is me, John, right? Nagizade. I, if you don't mind, I will. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, as Tarana already mentioned, my name is Mia John Nikizade, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Youth Assisting Youth, or YAY, as we often call it. And I'm here to share our insights on how our organization engages and supports in newcomer youth. So just a quick little background information about our organization. We've been operating in the city of Toronto and York Region for the past 48 years, and, we, and we've engaged in thousands of newcomers' youth in that time. Today, 45% of our clients are newcomers, 
Uh, over the years, we've matched over 5,000 youth with mentors, almost half of them newcomers, and more than 30,000 youth have come to our group programs. It's important to note that uh, we're a youth volunteer driven organization and we received over 2.5 million hours of youth volunteer uh, service since 1976. We're heavily engaged with newcomer youth and, we're, and we've developed some creative strategies and approaches to engage and support with them today. So uh, as you can see in my presentation, we do have a few approaches bolded and underlined throughout the slides. This is just to show you that they play a key role across the work that we do. So first off for our youth programs, we have our one-to-one -one peer mentoring program, which is the cornerstone of our work, where mentees ages six to 15 are matched with volunteer youth mentors ages 16 to 29. Mentorship is one of the most effective resources that you can give to a newcomer kid. We offer girls and boys empowerment programs, helping youth build social and emotional skills and self-confidence in a safe, gender-exclusive space. Our virtual tutoring program provides weekly academic support for newcomer youth, helping them improve their language skills and gain the confidence. Uh, we, all, we also offer short-term one-to-one mental health counseling and mental health self-care training, helping kids improve and take care of their mental health. Our group mentoring program gives our mentor matches access to free structured activities in the community that make connections and build sense of belonging and really strengthens the mentorship relationship itself. All these programs that I mentioned were developed to specifically support our core one-to-one -one mentoring program and mentoring relationships, providing a unique blend of services that increase newcomer youth engagement and support with cultural transition. Um, now for the engagement strategies. First up is our one-to-one -one mentorship model, which is a key part of engaging and building trust with newcomer youth and their families. We create cultural and cross-cultural relationships, making the program and relationship more meaningful and impactful. Our programs include cultural group activities and events designed to make our activities important and suitable for our clients. Using a community-based model, we bring services directly to our youth and their families. Mentoring happens at home, so we also include in-home assessments. This allows us to address several barriers to engagement. Next, families can enroll their children through self-referrals, increasing access. It's sad to say that not all newcomer families have access to a, a social worker when they need to. Uh, interpreter services and translations addresses language barriers as well. And with our materials, we're happy to say that with YAY, all our marketing materials is translated to 13 different languages. We provide flexible service delivery, making activities available during evenings and weekends and our commitment to ongoing family support through case management helps increase engagement because newcomer families need the support. And lastly, we always use safe and inclusive spaces. Everything I just mentioned today, all the strategies are effective in engaging newcomer youth and families because they make the program more appealing, accessible, and of course, a lot more meaningful. And that's it for the first question. John? And now I would like to invite Stephen and Rick to the stage. Somehow I have to close and then you are the third one, right? Great. You have your mic? Yes. Thank you, Torna. Um, like was mentioned, my name is Stefan. I'm the Youth and Access to Education Coordinator at FCJ. It's lovely to always be in spaces like this, and I always like it when I see a lot more new faces than familiar ones. It means that I'm in a space where I'm able to learn by contributing as well. Just to give a brief uh, rundown about our center for folks who might not be aware of us, FCJ has been working with newcomers and folks with precarious status for over the past 32 years. Uh, we broadly work in three core areas of immigration and refugee protection support, uh, settlement and integration, and public education. Uh, one of the things that our center uh, focuses a lot on is migrants and refugee claimants with precarious status and particularly focusing on uh, folks who might be in transition of their immigration status or folks without official immigration status here. Um, we provide support services in many different areas. This is just a broad range of the ones we have at our center. 
but focusing in on the youth program, if you envision this entire spectrum of settlement integration support, so things like work permits, study permits, PR applications, immigration, uh, sorry, settlement and integration supports like housing, education and access, connection to employment services and external referrals, people who are in employment situations that are not ideal, all of those kind of components fall under our anti-human trafficking program. We focus on sex trafficking and education more recently being used as a form of trafficking, but our major focus is on labor uh, education and labor being used as a form of trafficking very often. And uh, the system is designed in a way that doesn't allow for people to regularize easily. So the way to abuse them becomes more rampant. And then, of course, our public education program. We have webinars, podcasts. We invite people over to the Center for Conversations. We put out toolkits. Envision this as the center, but it replicated again just as the youth program itself. And that's why earlier in session two, I asked the question about vicarious trauma, because we are a team of just five of us, and we're providing this entire service delivery model to the number of, in the past 12 years of the existence of the youth network, we've served 600 youth. Uh, in the last year alone, 173 came by, and 154 of them stayed on with our youth network. So just, that's just to give you an idea. So it's this number of people that we see uh, on a regular basis, and uh, for those who come on a weekly uh, basis to our Wednesday sessions, it's a repeat service delivery model. So we're hearing these stories again, and the network was self-designed by the youth. So 12 years ago, when we had the service delivery model of the staff at the office just seeing folks that come in for a drop in intake, it was identified that a space for them to gather and build community was what was missing. So that's how the network started. And since its conception, some of those original four members still come to the sessions today. But since its conception, the idea has been youth deciding what they want to do, what's needed for their rights here in Canadian society, and working on it collaboratively together. With the pandemic, that sort of took a dip, and the numbers that were close to 100 dropped down to less than four, sometimes coming to a weekly session. Maximum, we would see 10 people, and online fatigue was something that was real. So the past couple of years has been us focusing on increasing the numbers, which we have done. Right now, we see around 140 folks, 144 most recently, compared to what's in our slide active in the network and on a weekly basis we invite 25 to 30 youth and we see them a lot of them regularly come every week so just one thing to point out on this slide um, in the sector we have the term safe space but the youth want this to be on the slide and they asked me to expand on it we call the FCJ youth network a brave space and the reason we call it a brave space is yes the environment cultivated there is safe for them. It is in a building that looks like a house. The space we gather in, as you can see in the pictures, are our backyard or our garage that's been uh, converted to a community space now. So they feel safe, they feel heard, they're respected in the space, and they, res they all made a uh, preamble to respect each other in the space, and they're also involved. So you hear me say 25 to 30 on a weekly basis, but 144 in the network. So the ones that don't show up to every week, they're still involved. We have a WhatsApp group. We have events that happen on a regular basis. So we make sure everyone is still kept together as a community, even if they're not physically present there. We have a lot of fun activities. Also, it's not always serious, but it also comes back to advocacy and activism on things that come up in these fun conversations of real life conversations and experiences that are happening on a daily basis. And you'll see on the screen some fun activities. The one to the complete right is an activity we did about learning about Canadian culture, but connecting it to the culture of the countries you come from. So keeping that integration aspect, but not forgetting where we come from. We have family dinners that happen last Wednesday of every month that does the similar thing. A bunch of youth pick recipes either that they like or from their home country. We cook together and we share community and share our cultures that way. And to the complete right, it's not in the slides yet, but I'm going to give you all a pre-official announcement announcement. Now that our, the group's number has grown significantly and we've seen a lot of emerging leaders come up again, we have a...
a group of seven youth leaders, which hopefully at the next Youth Vantage Forum is one of them speaking instead of me, that will be taking on complete leader leadership of the group. So handing over the leadership reins from just engagement into the youth's hands. Um, and I'm, I'm a newcomer youth myself, but the reason I say it in that way is that they receive the services from the center, but they also build the community space. I'm a staff of the center, so I get paid to do my work. They come out of their pure interest. So that's why we want the leadership to be in a place that there's no conflict of interest and they get the autonomy in all the decision-making processes. This, this slide just has a lot of the logistic information. Our official age range is 13 to 30. We see uh, average ages of 20 to 27, uh, and then the numbers of the youth in the network. As previous panelists has mentioned, folks come here with educational experience. There are barriers that exist, but we help them navigating that process. And a lot of the different countries where folks are from also listed here, and I think that's my last, uh, just to give you some description context to the uh, images. So the one on the top is our recent garage sale. So we don't have any official funding to run the network. We have funding that runs service provision connected to the network. So activities like this, where the youth lead these initiatives, brings money into the activities that they want to do. We also engage in advocacy at all the different levels of political conversation locally with all of our uh, elected representatives. We do it at the city level with the councillors, the municipal, uh, and then the provincial and federal levels as well. And the picture on the bottom half is a project we did with the Canadian Council of Refugees, uh, for refugees, which FCJ is a part of. That's how I'm uh, representing them here today. And that was on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And with that, thank you. This is a fun picture from a recent camping trip they did integrating into the Canadian context, and that's my contact information. Thank you, Fatma. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. And now I will invite Kitus uh, Satisfaren <laughs> Strides Toronto to talk about Stride Toronto. And Hello, everybody. My name is Gatusa or Kedusha Sodhiswaran, and I'm here on behalf of Strides Toronto. Strides Toronto is a multi service agency addressing the needs of children, youth, their families, and parents. We are located in Scarborough, um, and our services are predominantly out of running out of Scarborough, uh, out of the Scarborough community. Strides provides a wide range of exceptional programs and services to help our clients and their families achieve their personal best. Our agency supports clients from the prenatal stage to age 29 and their families. Our work helps strengthen their social and emotional well-being, move forward through adversity, and develop their abilities and skills to reach their full potential. At Strides, we have over 40 programs. So this is just a quick breakdown of some of the programs that pertain to youth ages 12 to 29 in the community service department. We have the zone, which is a beautiful youth space where youth are able to join um, as they like. The calendar here is a breakdown of all the different specific activities that run out of um, the zone in the evenings and the afternoons for when youth are available. We also have youth wellness hubs. We run also the gender-based violence program. We have a zone food mart that comes to us once a week where we do run a food bank to serve 30 to 35 families on a weekly basis. We also have the studio to media program where youth can come in, try to learn how to be a DJ, um, how to record a podcast or even a song. All of that is free of charge as well. We also have youth outreach workers and youth in transition uh, workers that work with youth one-on-one -on -one if, if youth need that support. We also run the RISE program and the target prevention programs that run in schools. Going into the Newcomer Youth Engagement Program, which is what I am on, um, I am on the team of. The NYEP program is designed for youth ages 12 to 21 who are immigrants to Canada. This program provides free activities that include volunteer opportunities for youth, community events, knowledge and skill building workshops, social groups, and local outings. 
eligibility requirements for our program is that youth are 12 to 21 year of years of age, sorry, um, and they are permanent residents or convention refugees. Now, our funding requirements makes us work with clients that do have P that are do have PR status or convention refugee status, but that hasn't stopped us from working with youth and their families that are in precarious statuses. Since 2019, we've approximately had 575 workshops, the volunteer, which include the volunteer program and community outings. Approximately 6,000 clients have accessed the NYEP program. We serve newcomer youth from many different communities. This fiscal year, we have um, a majority of families we serve this year were from East and Central Africa, Afghanistan, and Southeast Asia. Our um, Information and orientation pro workshops provide newcomer youth with the opportunities to increase their knowledge of life in Canada. Topics include Canadian heritage and history, Indigenous culture, truth and reconciliation, laws and bylaws, recreation and education opportunities. Community Connections programming provides newcomer youth with opportunities to improve their connections to communities and social networks. Activities include volunteering, employment readiness, participate in outings, attending workshops and special events and drop-ins. This here is an example of our program calendar for September. Um, as you can see, we run programs three to four times a week. Each program will look at a certain need within the newcomer community. Um, specifically this summer, we were able to bring our youth to a beautiful space called Little Canada, which is little miniature versions of all around Canada. It was very exciting, but also a very fun way for our youth to really understand the scope of the whole country. We also brought youth to Queen's Key to this uh, summer to teach them a little bit about canoeing. So physical activities where youth might not necessarily have access to or even learn much about being in Scarborough and versus back home. Uh, we were able to connect this with a lot of team building projects, which was very exciting, but also did kind of impart some skills building through our trips. In our programs, we offer TTC support. We also offer snacks and refreshments. Most of our programs happen after school, so this has been quite helpful in us um, supporting our youth in the way they need. We will discuss this, I will be able to discuss this a little bit later, but this is our Instagram page. Most of our engagement does happen through Instagram. Um, a couple of these videos here um, are from uh, reels made by youth themselves. One is from our rock climbing program and the other one is where we learned how to make gimbop together. And that's about it on my behalf. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kitusa. And now, as Kitusa already um, mentioned, she will talk more <laughs> later because I have a specific question. Actually, I think I can turn this screen off and we can have more intimate and quiet atmosphere to talk, um, to have discussion. So I did prepare three questions, but of course, you know, you will have uh, opportunity uh, to ask question. If I see it's taking long time, then I will cut my question and let auditory to ask and then continue so for you also just to know so my second question could you describe your organization current level of engagement with newcomer youth support services and the tools practices that have been most effective in addressing their needs please share one of the success stories with us and I would like to start again from you, Victor. You had yeah. some rest. Yeah, thank you, Tarina. Um, I do not think I can share one successful story. Why? Because I feel like success is a such a big term when we consider the journey of many um, newcomer youth, especially in my context, queer and trans newcomer youth. That success is given by the people with privilege and it's defined by the system and by the by the, the structure we have. What can be considered as success? Because they just have the housing, because they just, just have a status, because they have gone through the unbearable process of transitioning, so we can just deem it as success. I feel like we have no, I personally have no place of like labeling any stories as success, but I just want to kind of continue 
sharing some of the kind of like the experiences uh, we have been witnessing in our communities. Uh, as I said, um, queer and trans um, newcomer youth and also refugee youth uh, were often overlooked by the current system we have, and we do not have enough um, training and also this um, kind of like system infrastructure to support them. Um, many settlement agencies, they are not very, very aware how the intersection of, of um, sexuality, gender identity, and immigration status can really impact a person's um, kind of like um, migration journey is in this country. And we also um, tend to overlook how the current system uh, particularly um, you know, prevents certain people from entering this country, from getting the status in this country. Um, I, I, I believe, like even myself, I'm learning a lot about how, um, let's say, a refugee youth who identifies as queer and trans like how much information they have to prepare to pr prove in the courts that they are, you know, in danger of um, being discriminated against or being murdered, uh, being kind of like annihilated in their home countries. Because there's a, a certain process that they have to go through. And many of us, they, we, we don't know what it is. We're not aware of that, what that procedure looks like because of our privilege. So for me, I feel like, to, to talk about success is such a privileged um, stance. And I, I, I try to kind of, um, you know, learn and unlearn all the time. And I really, I'm very glad that Stephen mentioned about Brave Space, because we talk about Brave Space a lot at the Five Nineteen, especially when it comes to uh, interacting with, uh, you know, newcomer youth and refugee youth, because sometimes we conflict safety with comfort. We think the safe space is a space we feel comfortable. But discomfort sometimes is very important, especially in our life work. We have to feel this, um, uncomfortable because that comfort sometimes only extends to able-bodied, white, westernized, straight, uh, you know, cisgender people in, in, our, in our country. And that's just the reality. So I, I do you know, encourage you to sometimes embrace the discomfort, embrace the fear of not knowing because that's that will really push us forward. Thank you. So for us, when it comes to engagement tools, I've already covered several of our key practices and tools that we use, such as our one-to-one -one peer mentorship, uh, community-based services, in-home assessments. Um, I like to focus on some of the additional tools that we use. So first and foremost, our virtual tutoring program and homework clubs are a highly effective tool in engaging newcomer youth. It's something that they often need and it really does help them. Uh, we offer the boys and girls empowerment and leadership programs, giving youth the chance to make friends, gain skills, and be part of the program design. It's a great way to engage with newcomer youth because families want this type of service because it is very relevant to them. Uh, we also provide mental health counseling and offer trauma-informed support to help newcomer youth and their families cope with cultural transition. Uh, free counseling is always appealing and it always helps increase engagement. By providing meaningful, accessible, relevant programs and services, we're able to reach and engage newcomer families and newcomers youth on a much more deeper level. And when it comes to success stories, we of Ye have had so many successful stories, it's hard to just pick one. But if I had to pick just one, I have to go with Charlie's story, simply because it really shows what a great mentorship program can do for someone. Uh, uh, Charlie came to Ye when he was 12 years old as a newcomer. And when he came to our program, he was diagnosed with a learning disability by his teacher. And his teacher told him that he would never succeed academically. After hearing that, Charlie was ready to give up, quit school, and just get a job. But when he was matched with, our, with his youth mentor, Felipe, also known as Phil, Phil helped him gain confidence. Phil helped him improve his English. And eventually, Charlie graduated from high school, enrolled in George Brown College, and graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. Oh, sorry. Um, the great thing is, after graduating, Charlie himself became a mentor and was matched with a little boy named Jeffrey, who and Jeffrey himself was 12 years old, newcomer, and had a learning disability just like Charlie. Uh, when Charlie became, um, when Charlie became so sorry, when Charlie became a mentor, when he was matched with Jeffrey, um, he knew that he could change Jeffrey's life for the better the same way that his mentor, Felipe, changed his. 
Charlie helped Jeffrey overcome his bar uh, barriers and succeed, and Jeffrey is now headed to Western University next year. This type of example of a full circle story is a great example of how mentorship can help anyone, let alone newcomer kids to our programs. Thank you. I think I have uh, so much. I was going to talk about an individual story, and then when Victor started sharing, it, uh, the cogs started turning in my head. And I so much agree with that. Like, success is given by people who have the power and have decided that they are the ones authorized to give success. So I'm going to rethink my answer in terms of that. Uh, in terms of community programming, what we we'll try to do, and sometimes we are in over our heads when we turn out services and programs in this manner is we are very community centric, even though now in the recent years we grew from being 12 staff to 20 to now almost close to 50. We still uh, pride ourselves in being community and grassroots based because we are always there on the front lines, listening to what community needs are and building our programs based on that. One of the programs that comes to mind is in the past school year, since the post pandemic realities, a lot of kids, particularly families with uh, precarious immigration status were being mistreated and misinformed based on what legislation says and protects their right under age 18 to go to school. So in that time, while we were advocating with the school boards, teaching them the legislation which they should already know, we identified that a lot of kids were out of school, some for weeks, some for three months, some for six months, some almost a year. So we generated a community response, volunteers of youth themselves, folks who didn't have other opportunities because of this status started teaching these kids. So we had initially what we thought would be a three week curriculum of English and mathematics. Now is a three month curriculum and we push back really hard on the school boards to get ensure that the families are in school. But in the meantime, they're not missing out on this. So generating community based needs into a program and our center, the reason I said sometimes we go in over our head is capacity and funding. We do it regardless. And it's a community response. Folks in the network come together, they volunteer their time. And this is how we make sure community needs are being met. In terms of a success story, I think for us at the Youth Network and Tens and my colleague can back me up is when we don't see a youth displaying the need to be dependent on the Youth Network for some of their needs. It, it, we love to see them and we love to have them come back. But once we know that they're independent and by themselves, they don't need the supports of the center. For us, that's a success story. And it's, it's really amazing to see them flourish. One story that comes to mind is a youth that went through the system, a system that's supposed to be there to help them regularize. They were in the refugee process, the board member gave a decision and in their decision contradicts their decision. So they had to wait for an appeal. And that didn't deter them from their uh, goals in life here. They still connected with us. They were connected at the CCR. They led some youth groups there, some conversations. Now they even moved provinces after getting their status. They're on to their next journeys in life, studying medicine and continuing to give back to people. So it's lovely to see stories like that where, where the youth are taking initiative of their own lives and don't require to depend on any of the programs or services. Because that's the goal of the sector at the end, for none of us to be working in nonprofit, because equity is what's rooted in general society. Thank you. Thank you. So what strides are um, NY sorry, NYEP, we our current level of engagement with youth services. Um, primarily is focused out of the programming that we do on a weekly basis. We do a series, we do, we, we have programs called um, Employment Readiness, where, which we do through a series of programming called Hire Me. We also have volunteer programs. Um, this specific one I'm very happy to share is, uh, we did a series called Engage for Change, which was looking at the community, what does the community need? We realized um, clothing exchange and clothing drives are very important. So we started a series called Thrift and Thrive. This was a three-part series. The first one was where youth and the community donated items of clothing and materials they wanted to donate. Second series enlisted with youth joining, going to a laundromat, learning what that means, washing the clothes, separating them. And the third part was where we worked with City of Toronto. We had a space at a community center where we opened not opened the Thrift and Thrive 
strong drive, not only to our youth, who most of our families not only volunteered, most of the youth not only volunteered and supported and gave their time, but also brought their families that day to take up the resources that they need. So this went full circle in ways, and we're very happy to um, continue doing volunteer programs through that uh, perspective. We also do community outings, as I've shared before. Information and orientation is a very cool focus as well, because there's a lot of youth that have so many questions about post-secondary, about their high school journey, how that looks. So we have a beautiful partnership with Queen's University, specifically the Pathways to Education program, where even if you didn't go to Queens, uh, someone that is constantly getting that information and learning about all the new different changes comes into our program space and speaks on what the high school journey looks or different subjects under their settlement process. Through that as well, we've been able to get some vouchers where youth can apply for university for free. Um, one amongst the three has to be Queens, but again, the folks that come and work with us don't really care if you're going to Queens. So it's really just supporting them in a need that they may have, have either now or in the future. We also do psychoeducation programs, so that looks at health and wellness. I know earlier in the panel we were discussing how do we talk about mental health in a certain way. So health and wellness has been a great series that have allowed youth to just join and really connect in different ways. Tools that have been really um, helpful in, in, in engaging with youth have been Canva. Um, along, similar to uh, a previous post, um, we have youth that come once a month, look at our program calendar, and promote it in a way they find fun and engaging for youth like them. Volunt social media has been super helpful as well. Um, when our youth come and join us for field trips, we give them the opportunity to collect volunteer hours in a creative way. So they create reels themselves to promote it as an outreach tool to other newcomer youth. So with outreach, that's been a very successful practice in ways that we are getting the numbers in without having to do the traditional form of outreach as well, thanks to our youth. Transportation support has been a helpful tool not only to help youth use local transportation for free, but also support them on social behavior and practice while using transit. How many of us do? I mean, I came as a refugee that the blue seats meant something, that you need to stand on a certain side on an escalator before you get pushed on a subway station. You know, all of this are uh, common practices that we utilize to promote um, safer practice from the lens of our youth to the lens of our other youth. So that's been quite successful as well, or help. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Victor, for your um, description uh, and then explanation about the story success. I, uh, when I uh, prepared for this event, I had a speech with one speaker, it's not you, told me that I will make you uncomfortable. Yes, thank you making uncomfortable that that success is not always, not all projects always have a success and we are here today to share Whatever success is not success, but we can talk openly, honestly, and I appreciate for that. And thank you, everyone. It was lovely. I have another question, and I'm not running out of time. I know my uh, colleagues will remind me if I, I do so. So then following question, what are some innovative approaches or practices that have been, again, successful in reaching and engaging newcomer youth who may be hesitant to ac access support services. What are, you, are some challenges you have when trying to reach out to newcomer youth? And again, I will start with you, Victor. <laughs> yes, should I read again the question? Oh, okay. Yes, great. Thank you for reminding. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I'm also guilty of speaking so too fast sometimes. I um, just want to highlight some of the um, programs and services uh, we have at the 519, because it's actually quite unique here, because 519 is actually not a, a settlement agency, as you can tell, and we are not primarily um, serving kind of like newcomers or refugees. But 
interestingly, um, we happen to have lots of clients and program users who are newcomers and who are refugees. And for example, we have you know the trans ID clinic. Uh, we have you know um, the trans mail program. So it's really lovely during the um, pandemic because of the lockdown. Uh, many community members they came together to provide um, you know um, free mails to trans and uh, non-conforming identified um, community members in in our neighborhood. And most of them they are you know trans and non-conforming newcomers or, or uh, trans and non-conforming youth. And we also have um, programs on, um, you know, um, um, pre-employment. Um, and one um, kind of like innovative approach I have uh, witnessed is that like, um, I think I think two. For one is um, uh, culture-specific uh, queer or, or and trans-focused um, events. For example, we um, this year we did Brazilian Town Hall, which um, attracts lots of, um, um, you know, New, uh, queer and trans newcomer youth from uh, Brazil uh, to come together to celebrate, uh, you know, their sexuality and identity uh, within the context of their cultural heritage. And I think the second is, um, you know, um, providing uh, awareness and through different aspects of our services. The Farmington has a very um, unique early on service, uh, which is about, um, you know, integrating um, gender awareness and sexuality awareness into our early childhood education. And lots of, uh, like, you know, newcomer youth, they happen to volunteer uh, within that programs as well. So I feel like um, for us, it's more about how we can um, integrate all those kind of knowledge and information into different aspects of our services and that are not particularly designed uh, for, um, you know, newcomer youth or refugee youth. Um, instead, we try to, you know, um, make a service that is for everyone, but in which they also feel, feel included. So that, I think that's kind of a unique um, approach we are doing here. <laughs> yes, so did. Yes, right. Mijan, please. Um, so for us at Ye, we use a lot of different innovative practices to use to engage hard to reach youth. One of them being creative and strategic outreach, where a former creative or and strategic outreach, where a former or existing gay mentor and ambassador helps us recruit volunteers. Uh, wow. We deliver and attend family focused events. Um, the family focused events. Uh, so uh, the, to attract newcomer families by providing meaningful activities and safe spaces. Uh, we use targeted social media and digital uh, engagement, helping us reach and engage with many more youth. We also offer creative arts and expression programs, such as music production, cooking, visual arts, and more, helping us attract and engage more reluctant youth. And finally, we involve youth in the design of the events and the programs. Empowerment and collaborative program design makes the experience a lot more meaningful because the kids themselves are taking part of it, so that way we know that they'll um, really appreciate it. And for some of the challenges that we face when it comes to engagement, I feel all of us have seen a one degree or another, uh, such as language barriers, which are a very significant barrier for a newcomer and youth families to overcome, making it difficult for them to find the services and supports that they need. Cultural differences makes it challenging for families to find us, it makes it difficult for, for them to find us. Uh, economic barriers, so many newcomer youth and families do not have the income they need to obtain the support that they need. Uh, other barriers are social isolation and lack of networks. You know, uh, this can increase the back? challenges of engagement. There's also a lack of awareness about the services that we offer for newcomers often struggling to find the uh, services that they need. There's a stigma of fear and discrimination, which and can prevent newcomers' uh, youth from you. seeking help. Okay, so uh, mental health issues um, and trauma can make it very difficult for newcomers yeah, to engage I fully. And family pressures and expectations are often add to those barriers. Um, so the approaches, the strategies, and practices that we've discussed work to address these challenges. And it's also worth each. noting that every single program that I've mentioned so far for youth assisting youth is 100% okay. free, so okay. which obviously helps a lot of newcomers and everyone in general. Thank you. One. 
single one. Okay, yeah. at the front, there's a column that says notes. I think and what comes to mind is three kind of different um, key areas. One is, and I'm hearing a lot of this from the room, is the peer-to-peer -peer sharing of what the what the space can be for you, what <laughs> you can get out of so the space, and how you can give back. Pending. So one there, thing we've been doing more recently is of those, Every week when uh, we have our sessions, we have this period uh, of activities and then we have announcements and upcoming events. Colors. And when we do so, our announcements now, what we like to do as a part of the component is to check with the room how many folks have been to a previous event as such or um, how many of them have heard of some of the stuff we've done similar to that in the past years and then ask them to share from their experience of attending such event. What was the benefit of that? What did you really get out of it more than just describing it and saying this would be good to attend? So that's been helpful in encouraging more youth that might have been hesitant or might not feel like they have a voice in the room because they're new to the, to the group. It helps them relate to their peers because like I said, us on the staff, we are newcomer youth, but there's that unspoken barrier of their staff. Sometimes it might not be easier to access them during the week, but I can build a relationship with this one person and then we can continue the conversation as supports are needed. And the reason we've uh, made sure that the leadership team is there in place is they can come to us and share information that one, either the youth is not comfortable telling us or constructive feedback. So we can take that into consideration and us advocate with the organization to improve standards and make sure that the space is always getting better for youth access. Um, the other things that maybe come to mind in terms of innovative approaches are uh, making sure that youth are at the decision-making table. So one thing we have as a center is our board of directors needs to have at least one person who's a current or former member of the youth network and one person who is either a current or former resident of our transitional houses. So this ensures that that voice is there at that decision-making level, and then we as staff bring it upwards internally as well. So I think those are some strategic goals that have been working and serving the purpose for the group. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And Kirtusef. Thank you. So I feel like social media platforms are not that innovative. I do want, we, we, we do want to stick to this because I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, will agree that there's several stigmas around mental health uh, that are prevalent in newcomer communities. Often our youth could be hesitant to discuss their mental health so easily. Though we are a lead agency in mental health services and support, we have needed to be creative in how we approach this in our program. The use of social media to put out resources without being specific allows you to have informal conversations that give way to youth sharing about their challenges. With support of Instagram, we can provide opportunities for informal conversations, positive narratives about mental health. We are then able to ensure a successful referral for accessible and sensitive support services, either within the agency or in the community. Challenges when reaching out to newcomer youth is um, increasing client complexity at the intersections of multiple socioeconomic and cultural layers, such as housing insecurity, and houselessness, access to technology, food insecurity is a challenge when reaching out to newcomer youth and their families. But in addition, as shared before as well, language differences, transportation, access to certain services being so far via local transportation is very challenging. We have a limited budget within our program. We'd love to bring them to Toronto for downtown Toronto for a few of the programs, but the, the challenge of it taking three to four hours in total, in addition to the program time, is, is a challenge that we're constantly facing. So we are looking at grassroots organizations within the Scarborough community where we can connect our youth to instead more so, unless it's a summertime. Then summer, we can try to invest a little bit more time on the, on the TTC. Geographical location, so Toronto being a large city, GTA catchment area is so vast that it's hard to serve all youth in, in these spaces that would like to attend our program and benefit from our services. Funding restrictions, again, is just where I think we draw a huge line. It, it makes it really challenging to support the way we really like. Thank you, everyone. And it's nice to uh, hear, I mean, challenges opportunities and empowerment is the main um, focus in almost all 
organization. Thank you. And the last question on my end, how does your organization ensure a safe, supportive, and inclusive environment for newcomer youth to access support services? In your experience, what trauma-informed approaches, tools, or practices have effectively addressed their needs and engagement in your programs? Second part of the question, is they're trauma-informed? Yes. OK, OK. Um, so for the farm nettings, uh, sometimes the issues can be really complicated because uh, we are an open community center, and we also um, deal with really diverse um, demographic. I think one thing um, many settlement agencies here do not have to deal with is uh, um, do, how, do not have to deal with often is um, the substance use. And substance use is actually a prevalent issue right now in Toronto, especially um, you know in the um, the population of homeless youth, um, and in amongst the homeless um, and uh, homeless youth and youth who live um, below the private private land, um, queer and trans youth are disproportionately represented, and so um, sometimes like we have to um, you know deal with um, you know the safety the issues, especially when it comes to kind of like drug injection, um, also um, drug overdose all the time. And this happens, um, you know, in our programs where, you know, sometimes we have to deal with um, emergencies all the time in our neighborhood. So I think one, one thing we want to make sure is that like we want to um, create the kind of the platform where, you know, queer and trans newcomer youth voices can be prioritized, can be heard in this process. And we also acknowledge, um, you know, the daunting and tedious procedure we are seeking studies in this country, uh, especially uh, for those um, the queer and trans refugee claimants. And we want to make sure that, you know, during this procedure, uh, we, we, we can prioritize their personal well-being and uh, 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 mental wellness as well. And sometimes it proves to be um, really hard because they are um, not just, they can be precarious in different aspects, not just their status in the country, but also, in, like I said, housing. And, um, and also uh, how to navigate the systems with um, their kind of like sexuality and, and gender identity. Many of them, they have to hide, um, you know, their identity as a queer or trans uh, while accessing spaces and, and services. Um, you know, many, um, they, many of them do never feel safe in those shelters or just um, or, uh, get service from the regular settlement agencies. And that's the, uh, that's the common feedback we receive from them. Um, so I feel like this is an um, ongoing issue. We have to talk about trauma. We have to talk about trauma about, um, you know, how how um, you know they got here? We have to talk about trauma. How they navigate the system? We have. We also have to talk about trauma that is, you know, p still perpetuating by the system we uphold, and that's an ongoing conversation. That's an on ongoing responsibility we all have to share here. So I just feel like sometimes we have to take um, a step back to to see what is lacking, what is missing, and what has not been recognized by our services, by our, you know, um, the achievements, and we can, you know, restart from there. Yeah, thank you. Mijan? So some of the additional ways that youth assisting youth ensures a safe, supportive, inclusive environment for our newcomer clients and volunteers is that all of our volunteer mentors undergo cultural and diversity training that builds knowledge and awareness, preparing them to work with youth and families from all backgrounds. We use a comprehensive screening process for volunteers, ensuring that every mentor is properly vetted and equipped to support with youth in a trauma-informed manner. Uh, we adhere to a strict inclusion framework, code of conduct, and non-discrimination policy, essentially creating the foundation of understanding and respect for all. Uh, it's important to cover the interpreter services and translations again here. This is a very important practice that ensures clear communication and understanding of the needs of the youth and their families. Uh, we also offer ongoing family support, engagement, resources, and referrals, 
ensuring that families are involved and supported throughout their time in our programs. Lastly, we've, uh, lastly, though, even though we've covered it, we involve the youth in our program designs. Weekly mentoring activities are boys and girls empowerment programs, giving youth an active role in shaping the activities that they engage in. All of these things help build a safe, supportive, inclusive environment while also helping to increase engagement. But um, when speaking about trauma, because we are so deeply engaged with newcomer youth and families, we must use trauma-informed practices across our work to reach and engage with them. So some of the tools that we, and practices that we use to increase engagement are trauma-informed training. For our staff and mentors, uh, youth mentors must complete mandatory youth mental training and, lear and youth learning disabilities training before being matched with a mentee. This improves the relationship and builds trust with the family. Uh, we take strength-based approach, always focusing on strengths, capabilities, and youth rather than their challenges. Our programs empower youth by giving them the choice and controlling the activities that they participate in, which helps us engage with more youth, and that's very meaningful to them. We also offer mental youth counseling and self-care support, providing youth with the one-to-one -one support tools to manage their mental health well-being. This helps us engage with a lot more youth. Peer group activities and events that help foster a sense of community and belonging, giving newcomer youth and supportive network peers. And of course, lastly, we provide referrals to additional supports when needed, ensuring that the youth have success to all available resources. With all these amazing practices, we can really make sure that we can address all mental health and all trauma uh, cases that come through youth assisting youth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mijan, and thank you. Maybe we should follow the tradition, of Stephen. Uh, I was thinking a little about this question, and I'm going to uh, use the timeline, I guess, to call it from session two of identifying an issue, then have, being frustrated about it, finally accepting it, and then dealing with how you remedi remedy it. To set the context, so at FCJ, the the week looks like this. On Mondays, we have drop-in intakes, and it's a team of our leadership. So the three directors, our founder, uh, our protection team manager, and sometimes our in-house lawyer, they meet with the 60 to 90 people that drop in on a Monday. So most of the conversations about someone's individual case is being filtered through before before it comes to a staff that does the case management. So in most cases, as tradition has been, they, as a team, they, they have either experienced the process of being a refugee or a newcomer here, and they've been here from their precarious status all the way to being regularized. So they understand the system and have this lived experience that helps them work through a trauma-informed approach. But in recent years, like I mentioned, our organization has significantly grown from a very small team to a quite a large team. So not everyone comes with the lived educational or professional experience to deal with these heavy conversations and topics. So I think we're still in the process of the, the timeline phase of now we're past frustration. Our leadership structure has sort of changed in this last year. We went from our co-founder stepping back, just being the founder now. We have two new co-executive directors and a senior director. So they're in process of implementing a pro uh, component where all of us have staff trainings on the different topical areas that we need to learn more about. Stuff like working with folks with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, different languages, different cultures. Um, one, I'm going to give a shameless plug to Akasi for this. We have the Learn at Work opportunity to, through settlement.org through uh, that option so you can learn while you're at work and it's it's the organizations taking on the responsibility of this professional development so you're being trauma-informed in your approach but you're also not creating a disservice to the folks that are in need of a resource so i think that's where we're still in the process of navigating that but i think at least ex accepting the reality that yes maybe we don't know all of this information we shouldn't have to fake it learn, be realistic about where we are, and take the needed steps. I think that makes us better so we don't create more problems than positive outcomes for the folks that need something that is a positive outcome. Thank you very much, Stephen. And Kitus, if you don't mind a little, maybe shortly, we are running. I don't 
want to take from the participant time, we, we will try to address other uh, some questions. No problem. Um, so briefly, uh, at Strides, we use a comprehensive approach to assess and meet the intersectional needs of increasingly complex clients within our NYEP program. The needs assessment form is, has been really helpful for us. So it begins at the moment the youth start their registration, their intake with us. We've added the NARS report part of the initial registration, which remains confidential within the program. This standard assessment tool by IRCC allows us to see any need or referral they might have from the start. This is then continued by sharing not only the services we can support through NYEP, but also referring newcomer youth and their families to other program, uh, wraparound programs at Strides Toronto, for example, WhatsApp Counseling, The Zone, Youth Wellness Hubs. It, we then add that to their settlement plan on IRCC as well. Up on a weekly and program basis, we have registration forms that we use our, sorry, we provide to our youth to sign up for a program. We share program expectations right when, regi when youth register for that. So this usually is on forms and as a last question, it informs the youth the type of environment uh, they will be attending and best, practi best, best practices, sorry, for a safe and supportive environment while in program. We also provide our youth with a tour of program space while connecting them with other programs that can help. And this includes also making sure that youth that are attending this space are taking a trauma-informed approach and really just being respectful towards each other in that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And now we will take some questions from the auditory and online. Uh, we will try to address at least two uh, questions from auditory. Please try to give your questions short, shortly. Yeah. Yeah, hello again. <laughs> um, firstly, thank you all for coming to speak with us. I think we all agree that that was very insightful. Thank you for speaking eloquently and passionately about um, your services that you provide. So I would clap, but I have a microphone in my hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, my questions, I have two hopefully quick questions directed specifically towards uh, Ye and Strides. So for our friend at Ye, um, Maya Jan? Mia Jan. Yeah, or MJ for short, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Mia Jan. Um, you mentioned about in-home assessments. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what that means? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. And then the second question um, for Katusa at Strides, um, uh, you mentioned that you provide transit and presto fares. So if you can elaborate a bit more, if that's a partnership, if it was um, a donation, um, just so that for organizations who want to do the same, uh, we understand the process a bit better. Thank you. So regarding your question for the in-home assessment, as I mentioned, our programs are open to children ages 6 to 15. And because there's a mentor who will be picking them up and dropping them off at their home, we need to make sure it's a safe environment for the child and, of course, for the mentor. So what we do is we send one of our volunteer recruiters out there, and we just make sure that it is a safe environment for everyone, that there's no red flags or anything like that. But we also do it for the mentor's home as well. So just by making sure it's a safe environment for the mentor who's volunteering his or her time for the child and making sure that the child's home is a safe environment for the mentor as well. And just making sure there's no red flags, no drug paraphernalia, paraphernalia anything like that, where it might be a, a red flag where we might have to dismiss the program or dismiss the mentorship itself. So just making sure that it's safe, inclusive space for the child at their home, a safe, inclusive space for the mentor at their home, because it is a year long program, 10 hours a month. So they're not going to be out and about every single day. There will be a lazy Sunday where they just chill at home and just watch a movie or do arts and crafts. So we need to make sure that the safe, the, uh, the area that they're staying in is a safe space for all. Thank you, Michan. And I can take over. Um, so regards to the transportation support that we provide, this is part of the funding um, that we apply for with IRCC, but I do know that this also has to do with the partnership with Presto and Metrolinx as well, which they then send us packages of Presto tickets. We provide two per program. If we are traveling somewhere, we provide the tickets for them to travel, but also for them to get home and come back. So they don't really have to worry too much about spending out of pocket for to join our programs. Thank you so much. Please add to that. Yes, please. Because uh, 
sometimes youth don't know how, how they can access it. So with our programs, we do the TTCs. It's most of us, it's through funding. But now the Fair Transit program with the City of Toronto has expanded to more than just refugee claimants. So youth can get that discount availed on their regular transit cards as well. So it's good for them to connect with either a city worker through that program or a support staff that can connect them. Thank you. Thank you for the information. More questions? Do we have any questions online from online? Please. Uh... We have questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for say thank you for all the speakers. Uh, I I learned a lot from all of you guys. Thank you again. Uh, I have a specific question to Mia Jen. You mentioned about the family focus group or you have an event around that. Can you further explain that a little bit? Thank you. Absolutely. So actually just the summer that just passed, we had our youth uh, family camp day where all matches and their families were able to come down just to have a nice little thank you, have a nice little fun summer activity outside and just to make sure that, that everyone was able to come by with it. We also have lots of uh, events that we're invited to that we tell our matches to come to. For example, uh, this past summer, there was a movie night at McGregor Park in Scarborough. So all our mentors and matchees that were already in the program, we notified them that this is a free event provided by the city of Toronto. You can come by for that. And, and we try to involve as many family activities as possible where the uh, parents can come by as well. So we try to create family events. We also do lots of sporting events as well. So we give away tickets to Blue Jays games, Raptors games, things like that. But these are, oh, I need to specify this, these are people who are already enrolled in the program though. So we try to do, we try to create as many family events as possible. Yeah. yeah, there is a question from Fernando and the question is for Victor and Stefan. It says, how do your organizations incorporate an anti-oppressive perspective into real world practice? In specific cases, what, does success look like from this perspective? Additionally, what do you believe young people need to achieve for their future within this anti-oppressive oppressive, uh, framework? Stefan, I can answer first. So anti-oppressive education, anti-oppressive practice are the pillars of our works uh, at the 519 and everything it's about how we address anti-oppressive and the uh, you know anti-oppressive practice can look very differently. Um, one thing I can share is that like you know the initialism used by the 519 is 2 SLGBTQIA or 2 SLGBTQ. The initialism, yes. The so, or the acronym, yes. Sorry, um, the acronym we used here at the 519 is 2 SLGBTQIA or 2S LGBTQIA+. Uh, as I mentioned, the 519 is actually a city of Toronto agency, but that's not the acronym used by um, the city. So um, that the usage of acronym is an anti-oppressive political stance made by, made by the 519 because we want to prioritize two-spirit people in our own community. Because two-spirit people have been existing before the creation of Canada, before you know, the creation of colonial Canadian government. And when the British colonizers, they came to this land um, because they deemed that two-spirit people uh, were not fit for their Western um, Christian values. They created a different system to further marginalize and erase their existence. So practice, practice like this are very useful for us to uh, make sure um, you know, anti-oppressive framework is being inter uh, integrated into our programs, into our service. And we also believe that, you know, we also offer um, lots of trainings on fostering queer and trans inclusion, anti-black racism, you know, anti-oppressive practice um, to our volunteers, to our, um, you know, youth service users. Lots of um, queer and youth uh, refugees and newcomer youth, they receive those trainings to understand the context, including, um, for example, um, the HIV um, activism history in Canada, in Toronto as well. Do you want to add? Yeah. Yes. Please. Uh, I like 
Victor started the response that anti-oppression can look so many different ways. Uh, in our organization, one thing that we do at the staff level is we have annual staff retreats. Uh, th there's one that happens with the entire organization, and then we have a media one that happens with smaller groups, so each of the teams. And one of the things we start with is the power wheel. We use the one from the CCR. It's, it's easy to understand. It, it looks like the power flower that was used in a previous slide. So we are able to place ourselves and our social location on that and understand our oppressions and uh, our privileges from that. Just not, not to make anyone feel singled out, but just to understand where we fall and what implicit biases we might have that might or might not come up when we're working with people. Because something that someone has experienced that they share with you during case management might trigger something from your experience. So that's one way we do it at the staff level. With the youth network, we try to have these conversations on a regular basis and have it as a regular conversation. It doesn't need to be, today we're going to be talking about sexual orientation. No, just include it as part of the general conversation because these are topics that youth want to talk about and they are experiencing themselves. So if we don't make it feel like, oh, this is a topical discussion area, they're just gonna feel like it's a regular conversation and something that's part of us existing. So that's one way we do it at the network. And in sort of like a case management approach, something we do with all of the youth, instead of focusing on what they come to us with a need, we understand what their long-term goals look like here and work backwards to see how can we facilitate either it may be your status that's the barrier right now or finances but how can we facilitate getting you to that point with what uh, sort of uh, the different opportunities you have right now like maybe your status doesn't allow you to go to university but what can you take in the interim maybe you can take this informal education program that then once you get your status, gets you into post-secondary. So we focus more on long-term goals and work backwards instead of they might come to us and say, I need a work permit because I need money. But maybe they can go to a program, say one of the committees at our organization and get an honorarium that serves the financial side, but they can focus on what they really want. So I think that's the way we include the anti-oppressive approach at our Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I think it's time for us to end this session and have 15 minute break, but I would like to thank everyone, uh, all our panelists, for beautiful smiles, for sincere conversation, openness, and thank you, thank you everyone for your expertise.